button up your skinny jeans, folks. Protect your databases, folks, because it is a new week, and we are here for Off the Crossbar. I am the coach, Pete Eidner. I'm here with my main man, the co-coach, Adam the Miz Mizell, and we are here to talk about all things Baltimore soccer, and we have a show lined up for you today, folks. What we got cooking, we're going to talk about FC Baltimore Christos' big win over DC United. We have superstar player from the Harrisburg Heat, one of the best coaches around on the girls' side, Val Teixeira. We're going to be talking about what he's doing. We're going to talk about the role of the manager in club sports. And, of course, we are following up with what we couldn't get to last week, and that is Landon Donovan interview. So we are fired up here. Ms. How's it going? It's, still, it's going great. Thanks, bud. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but we also were able to lock in. In two weeks' time, we will have Cristiano Ronaldo in studio. I love it. This only happens here. And look at it. People are coming here, even with the gunfire of West Baltimore. <laughs> we have them here. All right. So tell me, Miz, how do we start the show? It's the misery question of the week, and I got to tell you, I'm, I've waged war at home. Waged war? The, the misery question this week is going to take you to the edge, okay? It's really going to press your outdoor skills, um, and, and you're going to have to really dig deep and try to come up with a solution for me. Okay. So over the past couple of weeks, I've been absolutely under siege with these lizards around my house. And I've seen them before, but this year it's just, it's off the charts. Literally, I walk out back and I feel like I'm in Jurassic Park. I'm pretty sure the other day I saw a velociraptor out there. So <laughs> my question to you, how do I get rid of these lizards? Well, I am actually going to say this. I have no freaking clue how to get rid of lizards. You live two miles from me. I've never seen a lizard in White Marsh before, ever. What are they, like salamanders? Newts-ish, I guess. I don't know. They're all over the place. Unbelievable. Here's what I would do. This is just me off the top of my head. I would get 15-year-old kid out of school, summer vacation. Get him a wiffle ball bat and let him smash away. That I, would be my thing. Or get a bigger lizard to chase the lizards. So ignore the Google suggestions of eggshells, mothballs, monkey balls, all, the, all that... Listen, Marvel. I don't want to hurt moths, and I don't want to hurt monkeys. So if you're going to use eggshells, that's fine. But I don't think you should be using mothballs or monkey balls for anything else than what God intended for mothballs and monkey balls to be used for. And that is to step on them, correct? Correct. As always, Ms. Off the Crossbar <laughs> is brought to you by my main man, Dr. Adam Maddox from Ideal Health Chiropractic. Coach, let me tell you something. This guy hooks you up. If you have any type of hip injury, back injury, he's the kind of chiropractor. What he does, he starts with the feet to make sure your feet are balanced yeah. and works his way up. I'm telling you, I my back was so jacked up a while back. I looked like that uh, that one woman in the movie... Um, speed? Not Speed, not Speed. The, the, the other one. Um, Mike and Dave need wedding dates? No, 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 no. The other one where the lady had the bad back. Pet Cemetery? Yeah, I was like the lady in Pet Cemetery when he opened the door and she's like, ah! That's the way my back was. Dr. Adam Maddox hooked me up, straightened me out, and I'm telling you, by the time he got done, I was dancing like George Jefferson from the Jeffersons, folks. I was moving, I was grooving, I was popping, I was locking. It all worked out. So go call Dr. Adam Maddox if you are having back issues because he is the man. And now, without further ado, you know who we got to bring in? I'm going to think about it a minute. I don't know. Making his way to the floor, none other than number seven in your program, number one in your hearts. Hold on. Hey, can we play the intro music for him? No! Kneel before Zod. Val to share, everybody. Val, what's happening? Hey, Pete. How are you? What's up, buddy? Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. Appreciate you being here, man. Thank you. Big Val starting off. Tell us what's going on with you. Uh, I mean, it's, it's been a great year so far. We just uh, finished up the tryouts with our club, and uh, we had a lot of quality kids show up, so we're just preparing things for the, for the fall. 
Now you're with Premier Copper Mine, right? Yes. And what is your title there? So uh, I'm a director of coaching for the girls program. Excellent, excellent. And that started that, and Premier was where you started and brought that program up, and then there's a merger with Copper Mine, correct? Yeah, so I started with Premier about seven, eight years ago. Primarily was just girls' side, mm -hmm. and then we added the boys' side, and now we just uh, partner up with Copper Mine. It's been a great uh, relationship so far. And you also coach at NDP, correct? Correct, the girls' varsity team. Girls' varsity, which, by the way, one of the best teams in the, it was at the IAAM? IAAM, that's our conference. We play a conference. It's very tough conference, isn't it? Absolutely. We play against the McDonough, Spalding, Mercy, John Carroll, yeah, St. Paul's teams, yeah. is now in a conference, Roland Park, so it's very competitive. What's the next step for you as we're going into the season? So uh, the next step is obviously my O1s uh, have State Cup finals this Sunday, and then we already qualified for regionals and national championships since mm -hmm. we won the National League. So the main thing is to keep everyone healthy, keep, keep everyone sharp, and get ready for the national title. Very cool, very cool. We need to bring, when's the last time we had a girls team win a national title from Baltimore? It's been a minute. It's been a while. I think uh, when I spoke to Brad Ruse, it was probably in the early 90s. So but I go back and I, I feel like we, we do a great job developing, you know, top level girls players in the area. And there's, you know, we have a lot of great coaches on the girls side. Yourself, Derek Woodward, Doug Pryor come to mind. Um, but, you know, what do you think is the, the problem with how come we can't get that next level player? Like, what, where does the what, what's the problem for you know not allowing those girls to kind of go all the way through? Like, can we we get great players locally and then collegiately, but why can't we get a player to the next level? Uh, I mean, I think it comes down to the kids knowing what they want. You know, a lot of kids want to play at the highest level, but as they get older, they see that you know the commitment is there and the hard work, and sometimes they just you know, change their, their goal and they just want to pursue playing in college and then stop after that. Uh, it's funny that you bring that up because one of my former players just signed a professional contract in Switzerland for FF Lugano. Uh, and they actually just won uh, a berth uh, entrance to play in the Champions League. So she'll be oh, playing nice. in the Women's Champions That's League. Awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Very congratulations. So, thank you. And you Very. said you've been in, in the on the girls' side and in, in locally for about seven years? Yeah, so I uh, moved to Baltimore in 2009. Uh, technically, I came to play for FC Baltimore uh, in the NASL, and then I started coaching at SAC for two years. And then from SAC, I uh, moved to uh, Premier Soccer Club. So back then, I actually started on the girls' side way back in the day. Um, but when I, was, when, when I was on the girls' side, it was like there wasn't as many talented players. There were some very talented players, but not as many. So I think the, 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 the level of, you know, the amount of, of players today on the girls' side is way far greater than it was back then. That's a credit to you and, and some of the other local coaches. But what do you think from when you from day one when you got here until today? Like, how do you see the girls' side evolved in the area? What do you think we're doing to to help that? Well, I think first and foremost, it's the women's side in this country has been growing a lot. I think winning the the World Cup helped a lot. So there's a lot of females playing soccer, and I think, you know, the numbers have grown every year. I think you know Baltimore. You know, not to be biased, I think it's probably one of the best states when it comes down to soccer. Uh, you know, it's, it's easy when you see our teams compete in the national level that we always go extremely far. But going back to your point that you said that why can't we get to the national title? I think, you know, there's, there's so many teams, so many clubs that, you know, each team will have maybe a handful of good players. But if, you know, at some point we can come to a, an agreement that collect the best players and put them in one team, I think we can win a lot of national titles in the boys' side or the girls' side. Do you feel like like regionally <clears throat> and, and then nationally, like on the girls' side, is it uh, where you know a, a certain club or a certain entity will collect players from far and wide and kind of try to build the best girls' teams that they can because they feel like maybe, hey, look, there's not as many quality girls' teams, so if we can kind of focus in on building one, we have a greater chance to win a national championship. Do you see that going? on? Yeah, I mean, obviously that, that would be something that would like to do as a, as a state and as a club. Uh, I mean, when we go play against the PDAs or the LA Legends, you know, all these big clubs from, you know, West Coast or even up north, they've done that. They've partnered up with other clubs and they just have 
three or four quality teams in the girls' side, and when they participate in the main event, you know, they, they always win because of that, because they have a bigger pool of players that they can choose from. So there's always that flexibility of players moving up and down, and the, the pool is just fantastic, you know. Unfortunately, we only have one team of 01s, but let's say if we partner up with three or four of the clubs, now the pool would be 50, 60 kids. Sure, right. And we would have a better opportunity to develop 50 kids instead of developing 18 kids. Well, to your credit, you hit it on a key word. It's a word that I'm passionate about when it comes to youth soccer, and that's development. Your team, your 01 team, has been together for years and years and years. Absolutely. And, and there is something to be said about taking a group of kids from here and fostering them all the way up to their college years where they are top shelf. Talk a little bit about that and the process of not only, not only developing kids, but maintaining the players that you have and always getting that one or two other kid to help you out. So, I mean, it's, it's funny you, you bring that up because since I've been coaching at Premier, you know, we've been very successful developing the, the kids and we always keep a high percentage of players. So, you know, at tryouts, uh, we might add maybe three or four kids because of that, because we have a large pool of players that we might just need to add one or two. Right. <clears throat> so as they develop, you know, obviously some kids develop faster than others. And then, you know, we can always bring one or two kids to kind of, you know, help b bring their team to the next level. But, you know, we, we, we always try our hardest to develop everyone at the same level, you know, and, uh, and then we keep the core together to kind of bring them up to the next level. Yeah. And another thing that I'll, I'll say is compliments to you. Whatever team that I've watched you coach, whether it be you know your younger kids at Premier, your older kids Premier, your NDP team, a lot of movement <coughs> off the ball. I mean, it is your your kids are zipping around all over the place. Now, the question I have for you as a coach is that something that you ingrain in them in the way you train, or are you finding kids that have that kind of mentality? And just saying, go to it. This is where I want you to be. Get there quick. Well, uh, you know, all the teams that I coach and train, it's always the same system because I, I, I believe in what I do and I've seen it, you know, being successful for mm -hmm. many years. So I tell the kids that, you know, the system works. Uh, it's a matter of you guys understanding the system, believing in the system and working together as a team. So, you know, at tryouts, I always look for the kids that are, have ability to move off the ball right. and then the other things I can do I can help them trap I can help them pass I can help them see the gaps to play the through balls but it's you know it's a lot of hard work it's a lot of uh, classroom work as well yeah uh, I mean I train my team just like a professional team we do a lot of video sessions we do a lot of technical sessions we do classroom sessions to kind of give them an idea of every possible scenario in a real game right so when they get to the game they've know what to expect if a certain scenario happens because we do train a certain way that they expect that. Very cool. Now, how about you as a player? When, when you were coming up playing, uh, you grew up in Portugal, correct? Exactly, yep. Grew up in Portugal. Did you have coaches that taught that same way or is that something you developed over time playing at different places, different countries, different coaches? So, you know, I grew up in Portugal, played for Benfica Juniors at the time. It was one of the best... European teams in a country. So I always had good coaches, great coaches. Uh, one of my coaches at Benfica was actually Jose Mourinho's assistant coach at Real Madrid at wow. Chelsea. So, you know, I've learned from some of the best they've pushed for me. And, and they said, if you continue to work hard, you have a lot of talent and you can go far. Uh, and then, you know, I came to America when I was 17. It was a kind mm -hmm. of heartbreaker, but I was able to develop in Europe and then come to US and continue that. So, but when I played, I've always visualized everything and I always thought ahead of everything. So, yeah. you know, as the ball was on the right side, if I'm in the left, I always said, if the ball comes to me, what's my next step? Who's open? What can I do to, uh, to make a, a certain right. scenario happen? So, and I tell my players that I said, when you play the game, you should be thinking like a computer. You know, before the ball gets to you, what's the next step? So you should try to be two or three steps ahead of everyone. You know, that's something that I took from uh, Pete Karinji playing for him. He, was, he always said great players think one step ahead, two steps ahead. The players that you watch on television, they're three and four steps exactly. ahead thinking where to be. And that changed me as a player because I was just a kid that if I got the ball, I did my best with it. And, and learning that 
change my game to being where do I need to be? Why do I need to be there? What's my next run? What happens if it goes wrong? And, and that changed my game as a player. Um, so what, when you came to America, where where'd you land? So my family came to Boston, Massachusetts. So I went to high school in uh, Massachusetts. And then, but you never uh, picked up the accent. I don't get it. No, uh, I, I, I do. Sometimes it comes out. Could you imagine <laughs> if he had a Boston accent and he's walking around going, Park my car. Park my car. <laughs> hey, come on, guy. I need to park my car. Let's go down Foley Field, hit some dingers, right? <laughs> <laughs> I would love to watch you coach on the sidelines. Mm. You got to cross the ball over there. What are you doing? <laughs> a little bit of Boston and Italian. I mean, it's there's a lot of... Uh, Ethnicity in Massachusetts, That's so you get a great. lot of those funny accents. To just bring you back in locally, like, are you are you kind of happy with where things are at on the girl side? What things do you think we can improve just around here? I know the you know the the, geogra the geography poses some challenges, yeah. the traffic, getting the training, and all that thing. But uh, is there anything we can do locally as as a collective unit to try to boost the girl side? Or are you happy with where it's at? I mean, there's, there's always room for improvement. I think, you know, me taking over the girls' side, I think it was a challenge because obviously, you know, when I coached at Loyola and the boys with Coach Lee, you know, it's a different type of coaching. You know, uh, the girls, you know, you got to approach them differently. But I've, I've been very blessed and happy to coach a lot of fantastic players. Uh, and I think one thing that we can improve is, one, give them a little bit more opportunities as far as, you know, if they want to play collegiately, if they want to play professionally, because we do have a lot of talent, and some of the players that I've coached or played at, you know, big to one programs, and I've asked them, I say, how come you've never tried to go pro? And a lot of them don't know how the process works. Sure. So I think that's one of the things that we can educate some of these kids and say, if you want to play overseas or if you want to try it out for one of the professional teams in in uh, in the U.S., you know, this is the route that you should go. Uh, me personally, my goal is to uh, to try to bring one of the best teams uh, to Baltimore uh, for the women's side. So, you know, I started a U23s girls two years ago that has a lot of my former players and a lot of kids from ODU, from Maryland University, from LaSalle, UNC. You know, you're talking about big programs sure. that kids from Maryland go to. So my goal and my dream is to maybe have a professional women's team in, in Baltimore. I think there's a lot of uh, talent here. I think there's a lot of people that enjoy the game, and I think if it's done the right way with the right people involved, it could be done. I mean, even for the men's side, I think that's one of the things that, you know, all of us that have a lot of passion for the game and have a lot of connections, why can't we all get together and say, let's do this for Baltimore, let's do the, this for the kids, Agreed. so the kids can have an opportunity to continue to play in their backyard. Yeah. Well, I, I'll tell you, I don't even know if you remember this, but I met you when you were playing for Crystal Palace. Mm -hmm. I was coaching in their youth program. Um, gosh, it must have been 2007, was, 2008, somewhere in that yep. ballpark. And you were that was a professional team playing here. Exactly. And, and you guys used to come out and help out with the kids' teams, and it was phenomenal. So that's where we met. And then, uh, then I went on to coach at UMBC, and we scrimmaged you guys at Crystal Palace. And... I'll never forget that game because we had a guy named Kevin Natico yep. who might have been the fastest human being I've ever seen. You were playing left back at the time, and we were having trouble. This guy, lightning fast, you're making every tackle. Yeah. And uh, that I, it just stuck out in my mind. The game was played on the turf at UMBC. It was one of those things I'll never forget. So what about a professional team on the men's side in Baltimore? Like we've had, you know, we've had uh, Crystal Palace. And then we've had the Baltimore Bohemians. Right now, FC Baltimore Christos seems to be doing well, by the way. What, what's the next step there? I mean, like I said, you know, the, the next step is the resources. You know, there's a lot of people that like the game, enjoy the game, is trying to get everyone together, sit in the table and say, what do we need to do to bring professional soccer to, uh, to Baltimore? I mean, remember a few years ago when Chelsea played against AC Milan, you know, MT Bank was packed. 70,000 70, people. You know, yeah. I mean, it's impressive. So why can't we bring something like that to, uh, to Baltimore with local kids and, you know, get some international players as well? I mean, I think there's a lot of potential. Uh, I think it would be a huge success, but you know what the number one thing needs to have happen behind it. Unfortunately, it's not the talent. It's a payola. It's yeah. the cash. Like Timmy Whitman was saying Sheesh. last week. People will follow the money if the money's there. Exactly. 
And so how do you go about solving that problem? You find a guy with a lot of money. Find a guy with a lot of money? <laughs> that is Adam and Ms. Mizell, everybody. Because we're in the basement of a bank and he knows how to get the cash. <laughs> On the way out, we'll just, you know, see if we can talk to a manager upstairs and see what happens. See if we can just get the ball little, Just a little bit of money. But I, you, it, it's funny you said that about the, the Chelsea game because I'm always thinking that. I'm like, wait a minute. When we get AC Milan here and Chelsea here and Real Madrid and Roma, it's 70,000 plus. Right, right. We put our own little, you know, pro team together. And whether it's USL or whatever. It doesn't matter, but so we go from seventy thousand to one thousand. Like I don't, that we we got to be better than that somehow. And mm-hmm. I think you know, I think it's starting to get back though. I think uh, momentum's going with FC Baltimore Cristo. So hopefully that keeps going. Well, why don't we segue and we'll talk about that right now? FC Baltimore Cristos. Uh, I know you're a Cristos guy. You're a Cristos guy. I'm a Cristos guy. C T I D. Anyway, um, that team's doing very well. They just played the DC United under 23s, and, uh, and came away with a 2-1 win. Um, played better than a 2-1 win, I thought. What do you think? Yeah, I think so, too, and it was, it was pretty cool in that game. We had a lot of local flavor on both rosters, right? So there were some kids from the area on the D.C. United roster, and then obviously the kids yeah. that we have on, on the Christos team as well. But um, I felt like Christos was better on the day. I mean, I didn't – you know, D.C. United had a couple looks – but um, other than the goal, I felt like, you know, there were, there were more. The, the play and the lion's share of the game kind of went towards FC, Christo, FC Baltimore Cristo's way, in my opinion. Yeah, and so I thought the same. Great goal at the beginning. Uh, Great combination play from about 20 yards out. Started with Trey Pulliam, and then it was bip, bip, bip. Knocked the ball across. Uh, a, a great swing in across the box. Everybody thought he was shooting from the six. Plays it in. And my favorite player, Nicky Gums, gets his second goal of the year. Nicky, what's up, Nicky Gums? Second goal of the year. And, uh, and from then, I just thought they were flat out better. A lot of kids from that position, uh, the final ball across where he slid it across the box and, and Gums was able to finish. A lot of kids would be programmed to try to shoot or finish from that, that range, that area, that look and angle. Um, the kid did well. Goalkeeper kind of played the shot, right? And so he knew that as long as there's a back post runner or you know, a guy there to play it to, it's, it's an easy goal. But sometimes there's no one there to play it to or you, you're really flirting with offsides there, so you have to be careful. But the right play, and it was a fantastic goal. The build-up before was absolutely beautiful. Perfect. So as the game went on, you know who really impressed me coming out of the back? Uh, a kid from Loyola University, uh, a, a, a Jonathan Souza, played a great game, um, I thought, coming out of the back for them. He assisted the first goal, so as the combination went by, he's the kid that made the decision to cut that ball back across the box. Um, anything on him, Val, you know him. Yeah, I mean, uh, he's from Portugal. Uh, met him last summer, uh, you know, Talked to him again not too long ago at Loyola about what his plans are. Uh, kid that grew up, uh, you know, playing for Red Bulls Academy. And uh, his goal is to be a professional soccer player. So I think he's got a lot of potential. He's, uh, he's very crafty on the ball. Yeah. He's smooth. And he, he sees the game a little bit earlier than others. And he's, he's able to bring that uh, variety to the FC Baltimore players. I thought, uh, seriously, I thought where they were their strongest was when D.C. United was starting to press a little bit on the attack. It wasn't just him, but it, all of them won the tackle, got it, kept the ball moving. And really, D.C. United had no answer. Now, what makes me impressed about that is FC Baltimore Christos beat Christos 4 nothing a week ago. Christos, two years ago, played D.C. United in the Open Cup, and up until the 85th minute, it was a 1-1 game, and, and I'm telling you right now, I was there. If Christos players have soccer as a full-time job, they win that game. Yeah, right. so, so Christos, very, very good team. FC Baltimore Christos might be on the track to taking this enough to another level. Could be. Time will tell. Time will tell, but a great win, no doubt. 2-1 against D.C. United U23. So having said that, home win, which is nice. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great, it's a great way to, to get going. And, and now they can start to, to, to click off the wins and hopefully finish up and get themselves a playoff position. You know, what we should do is when we show the highlights, let's see if we can get some music. What? 
We can't get the music. We can't get the music. Zod has said no. It's, yeah. Zod has said no. All right. So uh, let's take a break, talk about one of our sponsors, and we'll be right back with Val. Parents, kids, players, if you were looking for a camp this summer, look no further than Pete Karinji's All Maryland Soccer Camp. It's where I started to coach. When I was 18 years old, I was playing college, and Pete Karinji asked me to work his camp. Best move I ever made. I learned how to coach, but not only that, I learned how to connect with kids. And I watched it from the master, Pete Karinji. Pete Karinji has developed more players out of the Baltimore area and coached more kids and brought the game to a higher level than anyone else I know. He puts his heart into it, knows the kids by name, has more energy than five other coaches put together, and I'm not kidding about that. So, check out all Maryland soccer camps, Pete Karinji, websites right here. It's a blast. It is the most fun a young player can have. And if you have a very young player that's more talented than the group he's in, Pete recognizes that, moves him into a more challenging area. And the development of these kids is outstanding. I swear by it. I swear by it. Best camp in Baltimore. Welcome back to Off the Crossbar. I am the coach Pete Eibner. This is the co-coach Adam the Miz Mizell. And we are very happy to be with another Baltimore coach, one of the greats, Val Teixeira. Val, you're doing a great job. We're not yeah. kicking you out of the studio. We're having you back for the next segment. That's, and we've booted people out before, too. We've kicked much them less, right out. By the way. Much less. Thank you. So, Val, you coach successful teams. You build successful teams. The quality that you produce on the field, not in question. Question we have for you, how important is the manager in your success? I mean, just like any professional team, I mean, you need to have a good leader, starting with the owner, manager, coaches, physio. I think the manager is probably one of the most important pieces of a successful team uh, because, you know, they always have to plan everything, prepare everything so the coach doesn't have any headaches and distractions and the players just focus on playing. Managers, like, they, they have worries we'll never know, you know. Like, they're worried about what color is the other team wearing. So, you know, we make sure we have the right jersey and, you know, we had to upload stuff to the team snap and we have to make sure this is covered and that's covered. It's more, I mean, I've, I've been very blessed to have amazing managers, but it's, it's really one of those things where if you don't have a good manager, you can fall flat on your face as a group. I mean, it really is. They're so important. They're basically the backbone, you know, the, the main wizard behind the curtain, if you will. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a huge role in, in any sports team, but especially in club soccer with the travel, the hotels, things like that. I tell you what, if you don't have a manager that's up on top of things, it can all go swirling out of control. I mean, literally swirling out of control where hotels don't get booked, People are staying all over God's country where, where parents start to lose their shape as a unit, which affects the players. So managers are really important. Why don't we have coaching classes we got to take, right? Mm -hmm. Coaching classes are further education. How come there's nothing set up for managers? I mean, in our club, we do. We have a manager's meeting to kind of guide them and, and help them with their procedures. Uh, but again, I mean, I think, you know, to help the, the, the sport, you know, coaches get educated, managers should be educated, uh, directive coaches should be educated, even the players should get educated more often with injuries, because a lot of times we have a kid that is injured and they want to play and we have to tell them, you know, yeah. your health comes first. Absolutely. You know? Big one is concussions. No doubt. I mean, concussions, I'm going through this right now. One of my best players on my 2003s got a concussion three weeks ago, still suffering symptoms. And he's a kid that always wants to go. And, and you got to tell him you can't go. Can't roll the dice. You, you gotta can't him go. And, and follow and, doctor's orders and then follow protocol to get him back on the field. Exactly. But you know what blows my mind? Changing gears for a second. 
I mean, we're here in soccer, right? In soccer, they made a new rule a few years back that you can't head the ball until you're 12, which is crazy. Because now instead of kids heading the ball when it's here, they're putting their foot up to a kid's face and getting spikes to the cheek. But that's beside the point. I'm watching the girls' women's lacrosse national championship, right? Women's lacrosse national championship. I watch the men's too. Men wear helmets, shoulder pads. They got face masks. They're set. The they're, girls just wear girls, goggles. They got goggles like they're doing a science project. Right. Oh, and they get a <laughs> mouthpiece. They get a mouthpiece. And these girls, Maryland's playing Boston College. And Boston College is losing. And they're whacking the living out of these girls, it stick to the head, stick to that. Now it's getting called for a foul, but which is a lot of whistles and women's across. Oh across. my gosh! Can we get these young ladies a helmet? Can it's we? Coming. It's coming. Oh it's gotta be. It's gotta be gosh. on the horizon. There's no doubt. And we're protecting. And really, no one cares the way the men look ten years from now. But I'm sure in the wedding pictures, these young ladies are gonna want to look like like what's the guy from the Goonies? Oh, man. You're the guy from the Goonies! I don't know. What's the guy from the Goonies? Yeah! The Cyclops? The, yeah, I, the guy like... When I literally yeah, silly? Yeah! Uh, that guy I right there. That's the guy I'm talking about. That guy. I'm in 100% agreement, um, and the, the safety of the players is always paramount, no matter what we're, what we're doing, but... Um, I wanted to, to, to ask you, Val, what, you know, we were talking about like having the pro teams and, and the, the environment that it was when Christos played the DC United game down in Germantown. Um, how do we, how do we put that in a bottle and then bring it back up here and then lay it back out and, and kind of just steamroll it from there and just build, you know, the snowman, if you will, and, and get this thing going. How do we do that? I mean, I think it was a great example that Baltimore could have a professional team. I mean, the Germantown holds, what, eight, ten thousand. 10,000? Yeah. It was completely packed. It was uh, overcrowded. Yeah, it was overcrowded. I think that security wasn't expected a big crowd. And that was an hour, 15 away from, yeah, from, for sure. from, from the city. So imagine if that game was actually played here. Yeah. We could have probably had 15, 20,000. No question. And, and, by the way, for the record, not to offend D.C. United, but there might have been 100, 200 D.C. United fans. It was all Christos. Absolutely. All Christos. There were bus trips from Baltimore going down to watch the game, all of them wearing Christos stuff. And behind the goal, it was all the lime green. Everyone was wearing the Christos lime green shirt. It looked like a, a game in Europe. It, it was did. fantastic. I think Absolutely. part of that, though, to your point about the, the, the limited number of D.C. United fans is because they have a pro team, and they can kind of, well, we'll not go this week to see whoever this Christos team is. We're going to go see Red Bull, or we're going to go see the Portland Timbers. Yeah. You know, that's kind of probably how that happened. But um, I feel like if we get this – this thing going here eventually within the next couple of years, uh, it's going to be tough because, you know, the MLS at a certain point is going to get involved and they're going to say, hey, look, you got D.C. 45 minutes away. We're not going to get crazy and try to deplete the, the, the fan base and, and ask people to choose. And so they may look at it as a bad business move, and I think that's that's a problem. Yeah, but I mean, if you look at the geographic in New York, you have the and New York FC, and then you have sure, the Red I agree. Bulls. I mean, but that's that what brings the best out of the game is like you have two teams that are so close to each other that it becomes rivals, and it it becomes even a better environment overall. I mean, you have Manchester City, Man United. You know, it's it's a great uh, atmosphere, and I think it will benefit Baltimore if we can bring a professional team here. There's no question. And I'm going to tell you right now, there are people like me who grew up in Baltimore that get pissed off that we get lumped in with D.C. for everything. Mm -hmm. I really – Baltimore Colts left when I was maybe 13 or 14 years old, and I remember being livid that all of a sudden stores are selling Redskins crap. I don't want Redskins crap. I'd rather have no crap. But, but it's the same thing with Baltimore soccer. We are our own entity and, and respect it. And, and I say that if the right people, the right money, the right everything comes together, Baltimore soccer has a professional team.
Absolutely. Agreed. Baltimore is all, also, though, as, as great as we are, and we'll, we're willing to back anyone, but we also like a winner. So, it, you know, it's going to be tough to – and there'll be some of that, hey, look, we'll support you for a couple years, and if things don't start to turn around and go right, you know, that's where it can derail a little bit. But I think we would have no problem at all building a support, a fan base, and getting people behind a pro team. I, I just – I feel like we can make it happen. Again, look – when Mamadou Kinsai scored against DC United, he ran to the fence, and it was a mob scene at the fence. My daughter just got off ACL surgery, and she was sitting on the ground, and the rush of people down to the, from the hill, she almost got trampled. I had to lift her up and pull her out of the way. It was absolutely phenomenal. And that is the passion that Baltimore soccer has. We need to tap into that and keep that and build that. And I think it starts with FC Baltimore Christos. I think this town has to support that program. I mean, it doesn't even have to start at MLS. I mean, now with the USL, having USL 1 and USL 2, you can start at the lower level like FC Baltimore has and build your way up, bring the fan base, and uh, and just you know try to get to the highest level. I mean, you have FC Cincinnati that playing USL was averaging 15, 20,000 people. Right. You know, and then MLS looks at that and say, you know what? I think you guys could be a franchise for MLS. And that is the process. I mean, there's no question, you know, that that's that's kind of how it will have to be done. There's no one that's going to award, hey, poof, you get an MLS yeah. franchise in right. your city. It's just, you need to prove that there's going to be a fan base. Now, Val, you've played in the USL before, right? Yes. When you played in the USL, what was it like in Baltimore compared to other cities? So, you know, to be honest with you, I mean, we played against teams from all over the country. I mean, when we were in USL, we played against the Real Maryland. We played against a team in Massachusetts. We played against the Charlotte Eagles. Uh, we played against a team in Bermuda. So, you know, the fan base wasn't as big as expected, but there right. were some teams that averaged 2,000, 3,000, like we did a few games. Uh, but then the, the main key was the Open Cup. That's right. where every player wanted to shine to get there and move to the next level. So... We actually, you know, ended up beating a few MLS teams in the Open Cup, and we, uh, including DC United, that we yeah. beat them 2-0, and then uh, we ended up losing in a quarterfinals against the New England Revolution up in, uh, in Connecticut. But, you know, it's interesting that once we moved to the NASL, that we played against the, you know, the Portland Timbers, the Montreal Impact, right. the Vancouver Whitecaps. So now... You know, we go to Montreal, there's 15, 20,000 fans. Mm -hmm. We go to uh, Portland, the same thing. Yeah. You know, we go to uh, Montreal. You know, all those three clubs that now are MLS, they already had their fan base. And it was right. a great atmosphere that I always said to myself, why couldn't we have that in, in, in Maryland and Baltimore? We you should. Know? I mean, there's no excuse. Um, I, I, and that's why I, you know, I don't know if you can, you can feel it, but I love what FC Baltimore Christos is trying to do. Because I loved what Crystal Palace was trying to do, and I was so sad that it went away. Really, I think they would have hung in there for two, three more years. They got something really special. Yeah. I blame Val. If he would have scored a few more goals, <laughs> won a few more championships, you know. You know what? This brings me to a topic. I wasn't sure I was going to bring this up, but I got to bring this up. So I'm um, playing for Christos over 40. You're still in your 30s. You're playing over 30 for Christos. This You're was 10 years ago, by the way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and, and you're playing pro, but you're also, like, in the, in the offseason, playing over 30 for Christos. Jody Hayslip shows me this video of you scoring a great goal. And then it all goes wrong, Val. What happened? You run over to the sidelines. Yeah. You stand up on the boards and go like this. Some guy pulls out of a cooler... A shiny Michael Jackson glove <laughs> and puts it on your hand and you're waving like this to a bunch of people and they're waving back to you and then you do one of these numbers and <laughs> heave it into the crowd and some guy with a bad mustache tramples five seven-year-olds and takes it and starts jumping around what is the story behind the glove I mean to be honest with you I mean I always think that playing indoor is like fun. Yeah. Just because, you know, you can celebrate, you can go crazy. So one day I was just home and, uh, you know, my roommate had a, you know, a Michael Jackson glove from a Halloween costume. Right. And I said, I'm just going to take it one day, bring it to a game 
and use it as a celebration. So I did that in 2012. The fans loved it. I've been using it since then. Did you keep it in the bench and you score and run over it no, again? No, that's where people want to know where I kept it, so I won't say where I kept okay. it. It was hidden somewhere. I've heard rumors that it was on his person. <laughs> is, that, is, that, is there any truth to that no. rumor? That wasn't, it wasn't that. Okay. Because I heard that rumor, and based on where I heard it, I don't know if you want to be wearing the glove after that. Right. <laughs> but so, so indoor, your, your career there, you looked at it as fun. Do you think that's missing from the game today? I mean, yes. I mean, you know, for me, you know, I always say that the best players are the ones that are having fun playing. One of my favorite players was Ronaldinho. You always play with a smile. You put on a show. And I think that's what it's missing a lot. Uh, it's, you know, the, the players with passion, with a lot of enthusiasm, having, you know, the passion and enjoying the game, scoring goals and celebrating. I think that's what the fans want to see. You know, you can still be a professional, be serious, but embrace the moment, enjoy it, because at no time it's going to be, it's going to be gone. Yeah, I agree with you. How about at the youth level? Do you think, for the most part, we're doing right by the kids by making the game fun, or is it getting too serious too young? No, I mean, I think, you know, you can still have fun playing the game, but then obviously when it gets to a certain level, then they have to be a little bit more, you know, responsible and be a little bit more serious. You know, when you're talking about, you know, the competition that would go to National League, you know, yeah, we want to win, we want to be successful, but we want the kids to enjoy it. If you score a goal, have fun, hug yeah. each other, you know, plan sure. a celebration because that's what brings the best out of the team. And college coaches love to, to see that. You know, they want a kid that is like happy and enjoying the moment. I always felt like when the, 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 the stakes of the game determine how much fun the kids have. Like, uh, and, and it shouldn't be like that, but that's just by nature. If it's a high stakes game, uh, palms are sweaty, kids are nervous, and, and uh, they're, they're more apt to be serious about it, and you don't see as much fun and cut yeah. loose. But if it's a game where a scrimmage game on the side of a hill somewhere and no one cares, you see their real you know, personalities come out and they're having fun playing. You know, that's one of the things that I, I swear by is those scrimmages, playing pickup, that's where, that's where smiles are on the faces. Sure. And that, those prepare you, honest to God, for those big moments in games, the training and all that. It leads up to those big moments, but the passion starts getting together with your buddies, getting together with your friends, and kicking the snot out of each other. So, Val, we have one thing left to do, and that's talk about mullets. Did you ever have a mullet back in Portugal? No, I did. Uh, when I came to America, I did have a, you know, I used to change my hairstyle all the time. I had a mohawk, and then I had long hair like Didier Drogba. Then I dyed my hair blonde, and then, you know, I do crazy stuff. He has always had great hair. <laughs> like, from the time I've known him, one of the best, one of the best hairstyles in soccer. And it's always changing me. Done. Yeah, yeah but you don't have, have to option. worry about, you know, gel, wake up in the morning, you're good to go. <laughs> I'm good to go. We, I, save, we do save a lot of money on products. Absolutely. I know, but the bad thing is, you know how many sponsors, like I go to like, like hair care products wanting to sponsor the show, flat out no. Really? Minoxidil wants to, though. Mm. I, I can't remember the last time I used the LA Looks gel, you know, back in the day. <laughs> it's great. So, all right, what we have... We have our favorite mullet belongs to none other than the great late Patrick Swayze. We have different mullets because he had ma many mullets. Talk about his mullets. A plethora of them. I mean, he had young blood mullet. You have um, point, break, point mullet. break mullet. It just goes on. Roadhouse mullet. Roadhouse mullet was so nice, and but but he had to you know he had to not be nice sometimes. So it kind of got a little messy, but. Yeah, he's had so many great mullets over the over his career. It was, it was it's amazing. So what we do, we give one player each week the Patrick Swayze Player of the Week. Look at that beautiful mullet right there. Beautiful mullet, absolutely gorgeous. And now, who gets it, Coach? Because if you want the ultimate, you got to be willing to pay the ultimate price, Val. Um, Jonathan Souza from FC Baltimore Christos this week, player of the match for them as well. I thought so too. I agree. Uh, plays at Loyola. Awesome game. Great assist. Played his ass off. So here we go. John Souza. Boom. You are the ideal health chiropractic Patrick Swayze 
Player of the Week. We are off the crossbar. I am the coach, Pete Eibner. This is a co-coach, Adam Ismael. Special thanks to our special guest, Val Teixeira, for coming out and spending some time with us. Oh, we ran out of time. I'm so sorry. Landon Donovan, we he's will actually, get he's, back he's to you. He's calling right now. I can see your phone's going on. I am so sorry. We will get you on next week. We've run out of time. Everybody have a great week in soccer. We are off the crossbar, and we're out of here.